have here is what's called the rotor blade problem. And what this is is a rotor blade. This is something we'd see on the top of a helicopter that's going to rotate around with some period T. Now, this blade has a length L and a mass M. And as this rotates around, the whole thing's going in a circle, so there's going to have to be some centripetal force on this blade. So what we're going to go through and do is solve for the total force between the axle and the blade. We'll just call this F. Yes, it is centripetal, uh, but we'll just say it's some total force between this connecting pin or this axle and this blade here. Now, I understand in real life there would be a hub right here that's actually connecting this rotor to a rotating axle. But we're just going to say this is just sort of crudely attached right here to an axle so that the blade can rotate around its end. That'll affect our math later on. Uh, so in this problem, this is just some mass going in a circle. So we're going to obviously have to deal with centripetal force. Fc is mv squared over r. We've seen that before. Now, because centripetal force is dependent on velocity, but yet we're given period in this problem, not velocity, we're going to have to relate velocity back to period. So velocity being 2 pi r over period. This equation simply relating velocity to the circumference of a circle or the tangential displacement of any point on this rotor blade to its period. Now, at first glance, it looks like we can just take this rotor blade and say, all right, it has a certain mass and a certain radius. We'll, you know, take this equation, sub it in right there, and boom, now we've got a quick solution here. But then that begs the question, what's all this white paper for? What do we need this for? And, uh, well, the answer, my friends, is we have to be a little bit careful with this. Centripetal force is dependent on radius. The greater the radius, the greater centripetal force. Uh, similar issue with velocity here. They're radius dependent. So the question comes up, where or where along this rotor blade is the mass? And the answer is everywhere. Some of it's here, some of it's here, some of it's here, some of it's over here. As long as this is uniformly distributed along this rotor blade, it's everywhere. And it's equally everywhere. And so to solve this problem, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to look at every individual radius. And you might be thinking, how, how do you look at an individual radius? Well, we're going to look at just a teeny tiny little slice. A slice so thin, the entire slice is only at a single radius. We're going to say that radius is some value r. There's the distance away from the axis of rotation. And we're going to say this slice is so thin that it is only dr thick. What do I mean when I say dr? I mean an infinitely small change in r. So we're going to look at an infinitely small slice of rotor blade here. And we're going to find the infinitely small force on that infinitely small slice of rotor blade. And we're going to add up all of the infinitely small forces all the way along this blade to come up with some actual, tangible, total force on this blade. And I know it seems strange. You're thinking, how could there be any force on an infinitely small object? But this infinitely small object has to have some force on it. Otherwise, it couldn't go in a circle. So we're going to take a look at this and, and keep coming back to this idea of something being infinitely small or adding up an infinite number of slices here. That's the hard part about this rotor blade problem. That's why we got all this room for activities over here. Lots of fun in front of us. So let's first look at the mass of a slice. What slice, you ask? This slice right here. So this mass, it's not the total mass. It's a tiny little chunk of the total mass. So I'm not going to call it M. I'm going to say this mass is dm, a tiny little piece of the total mass. You might be thinking, hey, I paid attention in calculus class last week. Shouldn't this mean a small little change in mass? No, nope. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's a tiny little piece of the total. 
a small fraction of the total, an infinitely small piece of mass. That's all this is. This infinitely small piece of mass, well, it's the mass of this teeny tiny little slice, which we know is dr thick. Now, if only we had some way to talk about how massive, or <laughs> infinitely unmassive, uh, a length of rod is. Now, we know this rotor blade has a total mass M and a total length L. So that means the total mass per unit length is simply M over L. Now, this might be a new idea, a new concept to you. This is mass per unit length. That is to say, this is how much mass there is for every length of rotor blade we're dealing with. Now, in this case, the length of rotor blade we're dealing with is dr. And if you're struggling with this, maybe take a look at the units. We have something like kilograms over meters times meters. This is, in fact, mass. If you really don't believe me, let's take a look at what would happen if we were to look at all of our teeny tiny little slices? Let's say perhaps we wanted to add up all the masses of all the slices. Well, how oh how could we possibly add up an infinite number of slices? Well, what would happen if we took an infinite sum of all of our masses? What should we get? We should get the total mass. Well, let's go ahead and do exactly that. Let's add up an infinite sum of all of our masses per unit length times their length. Now, what I'm really concerned with here is adding up all the slices not from here on and forever with a plus C at the end. What I'm worried about is looking at all of the masses from 0 to L. And so watch what happens here. If we just take a real quick integral here, we're going to get the mass of all of our little slices. It's m over L, because these are constants, times dr. Well, there is no r in this function. And so what we're going to all of a sudden arrive at is r, because we're taking the integral of just m over L with respect to r. And we're going to evaluate that from 0 to L. Now, I know there's a lot of new ideas here. I know this whole idea of dr telling us what to integrate with respect to is a little bit foreign. If you're sitting in calculus class for the first time this year, something like that, you probably get really used to just seeing a dx at the end and going, I don't know what that's for, and you just ignore it. This is telling us what we're integrating with respect to. Not with respect to mass, not with respect to length, but with respect to r. Well, there was no r here. These are just constants. This is no different than trying to integrate 5 with respect to x. Okay, we're going through and all of a sudden pff, R shows up. Now, there's no plus C here. This is a definite integral. I'm looking at this integral over a defined range of values from zero to L. That's zero to L. So what I do is I simply substitute in L for R here. M over L. And then I'm going to have times L minus 0. Why is this L minus 0? Well, you know what? I'm going to let that be your calculus teacher's problem, okay? Um, this one, this is how we take a definite integral. When we look at this, all of a sudden what we see here now is if we do a little bit of math, we're left with these are going to cancel out the mass equals the mass. Holy smokes! What we've done is proven a couple of things here. The first thing we've proven, calculus works. The next thing we've proven is this weird, strange term of m over l, this mass per unit length. Even though it's an abstract idea, it might be a little bit new to you. It's the right direction. Now realize this is not the answer to the question. We've simply proved the mass of the rod is the mass of the rod. We haven't proved what we're really trying to find, and that is deriving a function for the total force acting centripetally on this rod. We've taken a fun little journey down some calculus route to find that m equals m. We know we're on the right track here with this function, but now we need to know what to do with this function now that we understand it. 
So what I want to do now is look at the force on a slice. Now, hit you with some more calculus here. We're not going to look at the total force because we're only looking at this slice right here. So we're going to look at an infinitely small chunk or piece of the total force, DFC. This is still centripetal force. It still follows this function, but we're not looking at the total mass. We're looking at just the mass of the slice traveling at some value V squared at some radius R. And we're going to sub in our term that we came up with for the total mass, or sorry, for the mass of the slice, DFC. V squared over L multiplied by R, dr. We need to not leave out this dr when we're subbing things in over here. I know I changed the arrangement of things slightly just to keep our fraction cleaned up a little bit. But don't leave this out. This is important. It's telling us, just like here, what we need to integrate with respect to. Now, you might get all excited again and say, hey, wow, that last time we got to do calculus, that was so much fun. Can I please do a definite integral again? Yeah, sure, but hold on. We have a little bit of work to do before that because you'll notice this v squared is hanging out in our term. And we don't have v squared given to us or v anywhere in this problem. We have a period. And we have to relate period to velocity because I don't want to allow a v to hang out in my result. It wasn't given to us in the problem. It can't be in our result. So we're going to substitute this function in right here. All right. And with a little bit of a cancel party here, we're going to clean this up just a little bit more. I switched around the 4 pi squared and the m because I like my numbers before I like my constants. Uh, but I want you to realize everything inside the parentheses here is a constant. The only variable is r. We're looking at all of our different slices at different radii. So this force right here, this infinitely small centripetal force, is the centripetal force on some slice at any value r that we choose to look at. So now, how do we come up with the total force on all of these slices? We have a term for the force on a single slice, but I want to look at an infinite number of slices. So now let's look at the total force. Well, the total force, F, is going to be an infinite sum of all of our tiny little infinitely small forces. We have an infinite number of slices and an infinite number of forces. And maybe now you're confusing yourself and thinking, hey, these infinitely small slices have infinitely small forces on them, but there's an infinite number of infinitely small forces. And you're absolutely right. And I want you to realize an infinite number of infinitely small forces, in this case anyway, is going to result in a finite force, an actual value. We could measure this in Newtons if we were given M, L, and T. So let's go through and let's substitute this in up here. F is equal to 4 pi squared m over L t squared r dr. And we're going to integrate this whole thing with respect to r. Now, what I want to be clear about is this is a definite integral. There's no plus c that's going to be hanging out at the end of our result here. I want to look at all of the slices from this point to this point or from this radius to this radius. Well, this radius right here is zero. The radius way out here on the end of the rod, that's L. I can rewrite this so this is a little bit less scary. I'm going to move the integral sign over here. All 
Realize, again, these are all constants. They're values. This could be given to us. This would be given to us. This could be given to us. These are actual constant values. The only thing we're integrating with respect to here is R. How do I know that? Because of this dr. We don't just ignore it like we do in calculus class or like some of you incorrectly tend to in calculus class, right? That has meaning to us. So let's integrate. All we're doing is taking the integral of r. All right, so we've got this function. We're going to evaluate it from 0 to L. I'm going to clean up this next line here with this 1 half and the 4. Okay, now why this works out this way? Again, like I said, I'm going to let your calculus teacher sort that out. We'll see this later on in other problems as well. But this is how we solve a definite integral. I don't want to spend time going over that right now. Uh, we finally clean this up a little bit further and we get this. This is the total force on this rotor blade as a function of the mass, the length, and its period. And that is the rotor blade problem. And that's all for now.